Hello everyone, I'm Aisha Khader for PCR Online and we are coming to you live on site from ESC Congress in Barcelona. And today I have the pleasure of uh, speaking with Professor Kartikeyan who presented this morning the late-breaking hotline results of Invictus which looked at rivaroxaban versus a VKA in rheumatic heart disease associated atrial fibrillation. Welcome Professor Kartikeyan, thank you for speaking thank with you. us. First of all, congratulations on the trial results you presented today. Uh, we do know that rheumatic heart disease is a huge burden in lower middle income countries where we both come from. So could you tell us a bit more about the background and rationale behind doing this very large trial? Uh, thank you, Aisha. So uh, you know that, like you said, rheumatic heart disease is a big problem. About 40 million people are affected world. And these are mainly in uh, low middle income countries. And most of these patients are young. Uh, the issue is that about a fifth of these patients have atrial fibrillation and they have an elevated risk of stroke. Uh, the problem with rheumatic AF is that there are really no proven therapies for uh, anticoagulants for this subset of the population because these patients have been systematically uh, excluded from the trials of atrial fibrillation. So if you, if you were to look at the initial uh, warfarin or BKA trials, they excluded patients with rheumatic AF because they thought that they were at relatively high risk of stroke. And subsequently, the uh, DOAC trials, which uh, compared DOACs with uh, VKAs, they also had to exclude because they were all non-inferiority trials. So as a result, we don't have any data for, uh, uh, direct data for uh, that applies to rheumatic information. So uh, we've been giving VKAs uh, for these patients and it's very difficult to monitor INR in these patients in our settings. So what we thought was that if we were to use a direct antibody, which does not need monitoring, and if we were to find this to be effective, it would have been a great uh, help to these patients. So that was the rationale of the Indian trial. Uh, so we, we basically recruited patients from uh, That's great. 24 countries and over 100 centers in exactly centers. where so, the bird Yeah, and it's the largest uh, RCT in rheumatic heart disease still made. So I think that's, that's a big take home as well because uh, 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 RHT doesn't really have too many years. No, absolutely. You spoke of how they were systematically excluded. Could you perhaps tell us the inclusion criteria for uh, patients to be enrolled in this trial? So, uh, when I said uh, they were systematically excluded, they were systematically excluded because of the belief that patients with rheumatic AF are at a prohibitively high risk of stroke. But this is really not true because if you actually look at the data, uh, they do not suggest uh, high risk, uh, not prohibitively high risk, certainly. So, what we did was uh, we recruited patients with documented rheumatic heart disease with documented also enrich these patients so that they had uh, uh, had high risk of stroke. So the way we did this was we needed to be imposed a few more eligibility criteria, at least one of which patient needed to have to get into the trial. So the most important one being the presence of minor stroke. So anybody with a uh, less than or equal to two centimeters square, which is considered moderate minor stroke. So that was one of the primary inclusion criteria, and 85% uh, of the patients were. Uh, uh, had my instructions. The second inclusion criteria was, of course, the uh, conventional chats RAS score. So anything more than two or more was another inclusion criteria, and about 15% of our patients had a chats score more than two. Uh, the uh, other ways in which people could have entered the trial was by having a left atrial thrombus or by having a spontaneous uh, apocot transtrasic trans trans so these were for principal inclusion criteria. Absolutely. So could you ten, tell us now the main takeaway result of this trial? Yeah, the, the main results were rather surprising to us uh, because uh, we expected that Trivoxaban would be at least as good if not better than uh, VKAs, but uh, it turned out that patients on VKA did far better than those on Trivoxaban for whatever reasons. And this difference was largely driven by a reduction in death in, in the VKA arm. So uh, the mortality rate was about 8% in the uh, river of the arm, or 8% per year. And it was about 6.5% in the VKA arm. So it was a substantial reduction in death. And this was highly statistically significant. In terms 
of baseline uh, characteristics, what, are, what was the proportion of moderate MS, and I think there were also nuances there. So these, uh, so these patients were uh, uh, very different from the conventional non papular atrial fibrillation patients. So these patients were younger, about full 50 years, 15 to 20 years younger than the usual one that we may have uh, subset. So patients were about 50 years away. And they were predominantly female because rheumatic heart disease preferentially affects females. And they, like I said earlier, they had 85% had at least moderate rheumatic diseases. And, uh, and they had very uh, uh, infrequently, they had hypertension, hypertension, or coronary disease. Not very infrequently, but much lower than what it is in the non AF population. So as a result, they had a low TADS mass scores. So on the whole, about 45% of patients had a TADS mass score of 0 or 1. So that made it, despite our attempts at enrichment, was a low risk, a low stroke risk population. Could we then address the question on everyone's mind about how the difference in uh, mortality can't really be explained by the differences of either stroke or bleeding in this trial? Yeah, this is a very intriguing result and like I said, it was very difficult for us to explain it. But uh, we did try and uh, look at what the possible mechanisms could be. And like you pointed out, uh, the number of deaths prevented was far larger than the number of strokes prevented. So as a result, uh, that could, cannot be an explanation for the reduction in death. And bleeding rates were quite low and they were similar with the two So that also does not explain the, death, uh, the difference in deaths. And uh, the deaths were also largely heart failure related deaths and sudden deaths. So that also does not uh, lend itself to any easy link with an anti event that we know of. The one uh, standout thing here is that this is an open label trial, and patients by design in the BKAR had to have frequent eye drops. And as a result of that, they had frequent healthcare contact. But whether this would have made such a large difference, uh, we're not sure. It's unlikely that that can uh, completely, entirely explain the results here. But it's, it's a possibility worth considering. Uh, but however, all the evidence doesn't, in fact, points away from it because we found that there was no difference in the uh, use of heart failure medications in both the arms, and there was also uh, no signal of increased hospitalization, no significant different difference in hospitalization for heart failure or the need for valvular pass or valve uh, replacement in these patients. So it doesn't fit in neatly, but uh, yeah, that's an explanation. We cannot ignore it. Absolutely. But, and that's also, I think, a very important point that you raised about frequent monitoring with PTINR. I mean, in a trial setup, the patients would be more, f more frequently uh, present for monitoring, but in the real world setting, that's really the challenge and perhaps why we needed this trial and it's a drug that didn't require monitoring. So, what yeah. are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it just uh, goes to show that when we try and we could do a good job here, so I think it's not yeah. difficult to, to, to do this in real world as well. I mean, it's worth it because it's reducing mortality for whatever reasons. If this is the thing that's reducing mortality, let's do it. So that's the... Uh, and we, we achieved excellent uh, VK adherence. I mean, this is unprecedented. People have not noted this, but no trial of antibodies has had 94% uh, adherence at what, four years ago? Oh, that so is that's remarkable. Really, and also we were able to achieve uh, INRs in range, uh, which are comparable with the trials done in the uh, high countries. So 65% of the patients had an INR in range at the end of the trial. So that's brilliant. It's brilliant. Congratulations on your trial. If you had one last takeaway you'd like to share with us before we close. Uh, I think uh, it's very rare to find uh, truly conclusive result. And I think, to my mind, this is a very conclusive result. Whatever the mechanism of benefit, it's very clear that VKAs should remain the standard of care. And the way we used VKAs in the trial is that we monitored diligently and we brought up the INR to a good level. So I think that should be the standard of care for patients. Thank you very much, Professor Karthik, and congratulations again. Thank Make you sure you...
Thank you. Make sure you log on to PCR Online for more videos and coverage from ESC Congress 2022. Thank you.